So the whole topic here for today is, is accelerated e-commerce adoption. Um, it was really interesting to see the panelists, um, or not the panelists, the people who took the poll, they said on average, most people said it advanced three to five years, but there's some people who said six to 10. So I guess let, let's ask you guys, You know, how do you see it? And I think Laura, you're gonna kick off and answer your question. How are you seeing e-commerce adoption? Any And any examples of, of changes of customer behavior that either substantiates or contradicts this advancement? Sure, I am. Um, the, the question of how many years is an interesting one and it's hard to know for sure. I think it's actually a little different generationally. Um, so I've seen a lot of good data that Gen Z and millennials, they're all in. They're trying new brands, their whole life is digital. They see no obstacle to, to just moving fully into that world. Um, adoption's a little bit, um, a little bit slower and a little bit a little bit less openness to try brand new things um, when you you know when you look at the the boomer generation and and my people and Gen X but um but across the board I think it's moving pretty fast and I think what's happening is um you know Joe mentioned um, in his great uh, speech a moment ago that people are trying to make their home their palace they're, 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 that a lot of the mindset right now is sort of how do you make life at home better. Um, and better can mean a lot of things. Better can mean safer. Better can be more enjoyable, more fun. Um, better can mean more stylish. Um, you know, we run online fashion companies, and so all of our work is digital. Um, we do have some stores for the Fabletics brand, but apart from that, all of our all of our work across our portfolio of brands is digital. And we're just seeing massive adoption of, of people being willing to say yes, people being willing to to try. Um, give us a try in the context of COVID, which has been exciting. I sit on the board of a handful of um, earlier stage e-commerce companies and they're seeing the same thing. I second what Joe said, which was, gosh, March was rough. Um, Cause everyone just sort of looked up and said, what the F just happened? Like wasn't expecting all of this. Um, but April was pretty amazing. Um, like, like phenomenally good in terms of folks willingness to really go all in on digital experiences. Um, and, and that has continued. Um, a little bit less since April, but but definitely moving in the direction of people trying to make their life at home better. And as we hunker down for what seems like it could be forever, um, I think it's it's increasingly um, on people's minds to figure out how they can create joy at home. I was going to pitch in for the baby boomers. I think the 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 best example I have uh -huh. is my mom orders everything online now. Uh, Same, it's, it's getting there. And I think, I think that's leading to the interesting questions organizations are, are asking right now, which is, um, you know, what behaviors have changed and how long are those going to stick? And I see people speculating about when they to 2019 normal. I think most of the people we consume are big, uh, and we need to adapt those customer experiences around, you know, a customer and markets that have fundamentally changed. You know, I think even if we had a vaccine, um, we would continue to buy those items online. Um, and I think we need to see that uh, digital adoption, her digital adoption as the new normal. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one a step further. Um, certainly, uh, you know, at Madison Reed, uh, we work with folks who typically have some more gray hair. So we're we're biased to, to some of the older generations, which we love. Um, and what we've seen is not only that willingness to try the brand, but willingness to try new ways to interact with the brand. So we've experimented with like video, you can imagine self-assessment of your personal hair color and how much gray percentage you have and all that can be quite difficult if you're doing it for the first time. And so we've experimented with video, uh, Zoom, FaceTime in the past, it, it, it didn't land. Um, now in the last three months, we've had massive success using using video. Um, so our our, our 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 color crew, which is our customer service center, who are licensed cosmetologists, are now using FaceTime and WhatsApp video mm -hmm. to interact with our clients. Um, we've got um, every Saturday, we have a hair color house party where we have hundreds of people joining in on these Zoom conversations, um, talking about, you know, their hair coloring problems, how they how they actually do, you know, hair color themselves. Um, and I couldn't imagine five months ago, 
um, using Zoom as a tool for kind of a, a, a way to speak to your consumer uh, on a D2C front. So it's been it's been fascinating. And Tyler, it must be great for your business. So many, um, so many stylists were just straight up not available for such an extended period of time. Um, so people tried it, and it turns out it's not not so bad to color your hair at home. Not so hard, yeah. The, one of the most amazing parts of the last few months was hearing uh, some of the comments that were sent in from new clients um, who had typically been salon goers and maybe had been salon goers for 40 or 50 years saying, I've colored my hair for the first time and it's been an amazing experience. And you know, for my, me myself, I've cut my hair for the first time myself and it's been, That's it was great. kind of empowering. Um, and so I, I know what that feeling is. So it's been, it's been really fun to watch. If I could, if I could add a, a little perspective too, in terms of what we're seeing with our customers, I think, it really is starting from how consumer behavior is shifting, right? And I think we've been on this journey before, or you know, for a while, let me say, but to the question that the pool raised, the acceleration of how consumers are interacting with brands, especially more digitally, um, and are more open, I think like you mentioned, Tyler, to these other formats and these other channels um, to get some of their questions answered, especially if they're new consumers who are shopping online for the first time. Um, just being more open to trying out these different digital tools um, to provide a utility for themselves, right? I think, you know, e-commerce is seeing a lot of volume and a lot of traffic, and are there other ways and other mechanisms to get support, whether it's for, you know, making a color decision or making a buying decision or even case purchase. So, you know, I think really anchoring on that consumer behavior and what's shifting for them and what they're open to trying. Um, I think, yeah, consumers are open to try a lot. Awesome. I think Rob is actually back on and I want to hand over the reins to him. Rob, can you, yep. can we hear you? Let's hear uh, you, All you right. hear me? Hey. Yeah. Uh, so always dangerous to, um, to try yeah. to jump back on the horse midstream. Um, but, uh, but hopefully I've, I've uh, caught enough to kind of know, know where we are in the panel. Um, hey, Tyler, I did want to ask you one follow-up because you were talking about Zoom and the use of some of these tools. Um, how sticky is that going to be going forward? Do you do you feel like now for Madison Reed, like, hey, it's it's we're there, like this is going to continue, or do you expect as people are able to get back into physical locations, the tide is maybe going to go back to some degree where it was? Um, do you have a sense for that, or or maybe that's not even a fair question? No, it's totally fair, and I think it's probably both. Uh, you know, the the joy um, and some of the sense of relief that we actually see in some of those hair color house parties over Zoom, um, like that's not going away. Like like uh, to the point that was just made about utility. There's some certain utility there, but you know, we have brick and mortar. Um, color bars kind of across the country. And as those have started opening up, especially for the retail purchases, um, the percent of new to brand clients coming in to, to Madison Reed to experience that consultation experience one on one with uh, with a licensed colorist in our in our in our color bars um, is, is also really special. And so I think we're going to see both coming out of it. Um, and 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 I don't think a single client will actually just do one. You know, they'll they'll go in for their first consultation in the color bar, and then um, and then when they have their box, and maybe after they've done their first coloring, they'll join a hair color house party to get some pro tips. Um, so it'll be it'll be both. That's super interesting because you know that's an intersection of the fact that the consumer maybe even pre-COVID would have been willing to do that, um, but but now they're much more clearly able to raise their hand. And then, not to pick on Madison Reed, because I think this applies everywhere, you guys being much more like, well, we don't have any choice, so we're going to do this. And, and and now you've got a new tool, a new way to access consumers. And if you think about that bar coming down now for people being able to experience um, you know, this part of your brand versus having to physically go there, it's a pretty big unlock. And and, and not at all to take away from the point of the power of physical lo locations, which which I want to come back to in, in, in a little bit. Um, For sure. As you may, I, I want to ask you a question because I think, uh, you know, one of the great things about having uh, someone like yourself who works across brands and across companies is that you can give us, you know, a, a broader perspective. And, you know, as uh, I know you guys uh, look not only across companies, but in, in specific to the area around customer service, which, which I think might be another one of these examples where companies may have found an unlock in the form of necessity, right? So 
Uh, a lot of people's customer service organizations have been put under a lot of strain as other ways of interacting with the brand got shut down, whether it was a physical store or, or some other form of interaction. And that may have created a scramble and, and then a, a willingness to do things that maybe wasn't there previously. Um, wh- what have you been seeing around that? Not, not just talking about the scramble and not just about shoring up customer service, so I'm sure you guys have been very ha- helpful on that front, but maybe if there were new ways people are using customer service, uh, you know, maybe to go on offense or to take the load off other channels or whatever the case would be. Anyway, I shouldn't be trying to lead the witness. What, what, what are you seeing and what could other companies maybe learn from what some of your client base is experiencing and how they're using customer service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think I would even expand the concept a bit. Um, I think oftentimes customer service is seen as sort of just service and support, um, you know, post sale uh, interactions. I think a lot of what our customers are coming to us with, especially e-commerce leaders, is more of customer experience and how can we help across the digital journey. And so as we've been talking about, e-commerce has seen such an acceleration since COVID. Um, a lot of the only ways that you can interact with brands now are online. And with that means higher transaction volume. So it means more inquiries, more inbounds, more people looking for help, whether that's help in, again, making that buying decision um, and getting assistance there where oftentimes it has been in person and in that one-to-one kind of uh, environment or also post-purchase, right? So I've made an order, I have questions about this order, I need updates, et cetera. And so we're hearing um, that these brands are really starting to get overwhelmed from all aspects, whether it's the post-service support, but also uh, prior to to customers making that purchase decision. And so what that entails is that, you know, customers are waiting, right? So a lot of these brands have had to kind of shift resources um, and make sure that they can provide that support. Some of them may have already had kind of on-site chat available and others may not. But across the board, across channels, what we're hearing from our customers is that there's increased volume, uh, their customers are waiting longer. And honestly, sometimes they're not waiting. Sometimes they're abandoning um, because they're angry and they can't get a hold of someone. You know, some of our customers are seeing up to 90 minutes um, to, to interact with, with, uh, with the brand, which is really hard to, to stomach. I know I'm not going to wait on hold for 90 minutes. And so what we're seeing is that uh, brands that are really thinking about this the right way are thinking about it in terms of how do they, you know, really translate those channels are being overburdened into some core investments, investment areas for them. And I think there's kind of two two areas that that we're seeing kind of um, improvements for for them. Um, One is around really embracing conversational channels and embracing messaging. So I think Tyler, you mentioned the kind of like one-to-one interaction, that's still relevant online. And so how do you enable that one-to-one communication, but how do you do it asynchronously? And how do you make sure it's always on so that as you're seeing volume increases in one channel, you can actually shift that volume from higher cost, more traditional channels like voice and email to more asynchronous and honestly lower cost messaging channels as well. Um, And the other is really adopting technology to help in terms of that scale. And so a lot of the work that we do is empowering conversational experiences, which are aided by natural language processing and machine learning. So how do you ensure that the questions that your customers are asking that you can actually accurately answer them and answer them immediately. And so I think these, the combination of these two tools have really been able to help support a lot of our brands in being able to provide always on efficient and high quality interactions to really take the burden off of some of their teams um, that has to really respond uh, very quickly to this influx of volume. All right, that that, that makes a lot of sense. And the the one point I'm gonna latch on to is this notion that, um, you know, it's often been commented on pre-COVID how digital uh, has sort of raised customer expectations in in all the touch points uh, Mm -hmm. of the companies they're interacting with, right? And that's not to say that we as an industry are are necessarily universally crushing on digital, but that the fact of, you know, quick response times, fast shipping, the, the items always available, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, have sort of set a new bar that that then shows up in places like um, uh, customer service. It also shows up uh, and can in physical stores. So I mentioned I wanted to go back to, uh, you know, offline for a minute. And uh, I'm going to lean on uh, Darren and Tyler for this one, um, although others are certainly welcome to join in. Um, 
you know, I was lucky enough before joining Minotian to work with a very strong uh, stores team, great co- collaborators, great partners, and, and, you know, tremendously supportive of er- everything we were doing in digital. Um, and, you know, really benefited from that. And if we look now at this notion, you know, the poll, I guess, the, the, as Veronica said, the top top poll result of how far the customers leap, leap forward, uh, you know, three to five, although a strong second was, was uh, you know, six, ten years. Um, stores, on the other hand, have in many cases literally been locked down, like they're, they're closed, they're dark. Um, and, you know, just curious, it did, are the, are we able to leap forward in this place too? Maybe there's an opportunity to having uh, a bit of a, a lockdown as, as maybe counterintuitive as that, as that sounds. Sometimes, you know, a reset like that gives you time to sort of step back and rethink. But I'd love um, to hear, Darren, maybe maybe I'll start from you, uh, from your perspective. Thoughts on, because uh, I know you run the stores uh, for, for Vera Bradley, mm-hmm. um, where stores can and should move forward um, either analogously or, or maybe in a different direction from what we've been talking about vis-a-vis digital. Yeah, I think I think one of the challenging things, I mean, obviously stores have had the biggest setback since COVID set in. Uh, you take two of, of America's like best uh, entertainments in shopping and eating out pretty much were de- deprioritized by customers. Uh, right away. But I think, make no mistake, shopping uh, in physical stores. I saw a stat that said 78% of people are really missing that shopping in store um, during the COVID. And maybe that's because everybody's locked in their house and just wants to to see some other people. But, um, you know, we've focused our stores on, on that adaptation. So like many, we did curbside pickup and these sorts of things. But curbside pickup, it's difficult for that to pay the rent in your stores. So we've also focused a lot on how do we kind of replicate some of the best parts of that pre-COVID shopping experience. Um, So we've done appointment selling where we'll let uh, one or two customers into the store, uh, even when things were relatively locked down. We have done a ton of phone selling, a ton of social selling, uh, all sorts of live streams, FaceTimes if we needed to, anything that helps that customer and associate feel safe and engaged. Um, You know, I think that engagement is how it evolves, the store evolves. So in the peak of, 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 you know, the cases, we, we asked, we're a brand about customer service. We asked those associates just to reach out to good customers, give them a call and see how things were going. No sell, no anything, just how are you adapting? Because that's important to us for a brand and that engagement and how they engage over time will be how stores evolve. And I think we're all working uh, through that right now. I mean, we have a whole set of tools this week for uh, doing more stints. So um, we'd love to hear what Tyler yeah, has yeah. to say well, as well. And Tyler, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of uh, add a little bit to the question, but it sounds like Darren that you're, you're, you know, again, making uh, um, uh, lemonade out of the lemons. You guys found uh, ways to, again, maybe not fully pay the rent, but but try some new things, try some different things, try things that maybe there wasn't time for or the organizational will to get done. Tested, in a sense, you've had a great testing opportunity to try them out, and some of these will persist and stick uh, post-COVID. Um, so, you know, Tyler, one thing we hear a lot is that uh, the U.S. in particular is overstored, um, and at the same time, though, there are brands like yours uh, that uh, you know are investing in stores as a you know, hey, this is a this is still a growth channel for us. We don't need to shrink our storefront. And I, I think I saw you guys have a, a pretty aggressive store rollout plan. Um, what sort of things, you know, same same question I had asked Darren. What sort of things that maybe uh, are now going to maybe go into that rollout plan or? Uh, maybe things you're going to be doing differently uh, on the digital side to support those stores um, that, you know, either became uh, moved up in the pecking order of the prioritization because of COVID, or, or maybe just was a new opportunity that got exposed. Um, and l- love to hear your thoughts on that area generally. For sure. Yeah. I think the first thing we did was sit down and confirm that our, that our strategy was still sound. Right, um, you know, it's a massive investment to to grow out your your store fleet, um, and so for us, it was so clear that we have this 
um, really important place in the community where folks can come in and have a one-on-one -on -one consultation, but also to get services done. And granted, that's been pulled back significantly over the last few months. Um, but you know, we certainly see a world in the hopefully not too distant future will that where that will come back so the strategy of actually providing services and an experience within your store still works i think when you talked about um you know america having too much retail i think what we have is too much boring kind of non-experiential retail like if you're just yeah, going to well, go in to buy a commoditized item um you know you can do that online like i'm not going into a store to buy toilet paper anymore right um so if you sell toilet paper like you better figure something out um, and then, and then further to that, you know, we're thinking about um, what, 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 what's, what is the culture of stores going to be like, and and uh, and 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 decorum in stores going to be like in a year. And so, one thing we're leaning to hard is, um, is there a way that we can uh, challenge ourselves to um, actually not have the customer have to touch a single thing in the store? What if they could walk in and actually, you know, sort of like you know, you get your towel in the, in the restroom and try not to touch anything, right? Like, how do we make it such that um, that she can actually use her mobile device for every single interaction from check-in to tipping to payment to confirming, you know, some information we get from her to make sure we're getting the color right um, to how do we send her um, like how-tos directly to her phone if she's decided she wants to be an at-home client, like all of those pieces. Um, and so, you know, we're leaning hard into what we already have as a really well built out kind of mobile ecosystem. Um, but, but thinking about that in the future, um, so that clients feel really comfortable coming in, um, and, and feel comfortable interacting with the brand. No, that, that's, so that's Rob, fantastic. Rob, and I'm going to, I'm going to say, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say it, to the second part of your question, I think one thing not to gloss over especially during this pandemic is how it's been so geographical. So if you were in New York True. in March, it was tough times. If you're in Texas, California, Florida right now, it was tough times. They really inverted. Our sales staff uh, in the stores have been amazing at telling us what's happening in each region. I think that's something not to get lost is as long as you have that two-way communication, you have a much better idea how each location is uh, taking taking things, especially in times like back to school. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good, good reminder to stay close to the front line and, and also not uh, overly apply averages. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, start I'm going to not start to I am going to wrap us up now because we're basically at time. But I, I love uh, where Tyler left things around kind of rethinking, you know, everything about the store, the culture, the interaction, et cetera. And I think certainly from my perspective, maybe the big takeaway from this panel is that, you know, everyone should bring fresh eyes to their business, right? The, the customers leap forward, whether it's three years, five years, 10 years, that is different. And so if you're thinking about things the way you thought about them uh, in mid-March, um, you, you need to step back and think again. And then moving uh, and intersecting with that phenomena is the fact that your organization uh, openness to doing things differently, uh, necessity to do things differently is fundamentally in a different place from where it was, uh, again, in mid-March. And so I think if we as leaders are not uh, recognizing those two uh, pretty overwhelming uh, consequences of the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to at worst leave money on the table and miss opportunities, uh, or sorry, at best leave money on the table and miss opportunities, and at worst, uh, you know, get left behind uh, by the broader industry. 